Here we are. Good morning, everyone who are uh, listening in and everyone on the panel. <laughs> right now, we're more on the panel than listening, but uh, I think people will be yeah, there. Yeah, people jumping in. So hello uh, and welcome to this session where we will be talking about pioneering change in the post-COVID generation of entrepreneurs. My name is uh, Ami Kinde, uh, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session. And with me here today, I have a panel of extraordinary entrepreneurs. So I'll ask each one of them to introduce themselves in a little bit. But uh, first, I'm just going to uh, talk about uh, or mention the questions we're going to discuss today. So we, um, we all know that this um, situation we've all been in the last year has influenced all of us in different ways. And uh, as entrepreneurs, of course, as well. But what we are focusing on today is what good things have actually come out of this situation. So uh, we're going to discuss like the positive outcomes actually uh, for our businesses or as entrepreneurs uh, that COVID actually has led to. And the other question we are going to discuss is um, what kind of skills do we see as um, essential for the post-COVID generation of entrepreneurs. Um, and, uh, and then we're just going to continue there. And all people, all of you uh, and everyone in the room, we're just going to uh, throw in the questions, raise your hand uh, and engage with us uh, because that will make it even more fun. So with that, um, I'd love to just uh, maybe, Michael, do you want to, no, James, yeah, Michael, do you want to start uh, introducing yourself? Sure, just the introduction of myself, yes? Yes, so, thank you. Hello, everyone, and we're going to keep on a strict uh, timeline here because we're all going to try to perform well for you on the panel. Uh, I live in uh, Silicon Valley, I live in Palo Alto. My name is Michael Furtick. I have been doing startups uh, pretty much my whole uh, career and pretty much my whole adult life. I've started a few companies you've probably heard of, and in the last five years, I'm wearing my branding, I'm wearing my heroic T-shirt, in the last five years, I have uh, been funding companies as heroic ventures, uh, including a couple companies, a few companies you might have heard of as well. Um, and I focus on two things in, in funding. One is I want to be the first investor ever in your company. So I don't want to be after friends and family. I want to be right there uh, first. Uh, so I'm pretty religious about that. And second is I only fund companies in Silicon Valley and Israel. And so there are always some exceptions to those two religious principles, but those are the things that I do when I fund companies in high tech and life sciences and consumer and SaaS and AI and quantum computing and uh, in chips, hardware, software. So it's a pretty broad waterfront, but um, I'm pretty religious as the stage and geography. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Alper, would you go next, please? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alper Chakur. Uh, I'm in currently Los Angeles. I've been here the last 17 years, but I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, my background is pretty much all startups as well. Well, actually, it's a wind road for me. My background started as a musician, which has a lot of uh, entrepreneurship seed in it. And then eventually I went into design and that led into uh, starting my startup friendly agency, which led into starting my own company. Uh, called Extensio. So like I'm running Extensio now. Extensio is an online platform for creating, managing and sharing business collateral. Uh, and the journey has not only uh, introduced me to startups, but also helped me work really close with them. So including my last startup, as well as my previous clients, I've been really uh, soaked into the, uh, the weeds of all the startup life and the entrepreneurship journey you know, and and uh, and here we are. Uh, so uh, this year has been a little bit different than the previous ones for sure, uh, but there's been a lot of learning. So I'm hoping to share some of that with you guys today. Thank you so much, and Daniel, all the way from Hong Kong. Hi everyone, <laughs> my name's Daniel Lowe. I'm the founder and CEO of Global Chart. Um, bit of my background, um, I actually came from a, a banking background and. Um, started my first venture seven and a half years ago and failed three of them. And then uh, with Google Chart, um, we're six year in. So uh, <laughs> I failed my first three businesses within the third year. And uh, we're 
you know, we specialize in basically mobile apps and um, UA, so we use acquisition. We've worked with over 2,000 apps globally. Around about 50% of, of all the Hong Kong uh, banks. So we've worked with a lot of banking customers. And so uh, we also have a SaaS that we are launching, uh, hopefully, within the next quarter. And, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be joining the panel today. Thank you. Welcome. And John? Hey, folks. I'm John Metcalf, and I'm the CEO of Upgraded. We uh, help companies launch trade-in and upgrade programs. So trade-in and upgraded pro upgrade program is what you might have on your cell phone um, through your carrier, where you get a new one every year and you give the old one back. So we power programs like that for um, Apple. They power their easy upgrade program. For Microsoft, we power their Xbox All Access. And uh, for a retailer in the Nordics, which is where we were born, uh, we power a program called Renew It for L Shop and El Giganten. Um, so our, our goal is to help these retailers or carriers move billions in sales to these high, lo <coughs> high loyalty, high LTV programs. Um, so about me personally, I grew up in Texas. I was homeschooled by hippie parents. Uh, I can speak basic Mandarin because I lived in Beijing first and then uh, Shang Beijing, Shanghai, and then Hong Kong for five years. Um, I bootstrapped my last company in Hong Kong, Demand Analytics. Uh, we sold it to Groupon before they tanked. Uh, besides working for uh, as an EIR in Hong, in Hong Kong at Arbor Ventures and for a friend's company for one year, I've always been an entrepreneur, either as a freelance software developer uh, or, or working on my own company. Um, and entrepreneurship for me has been about lots of ups and downs. You have all of your risk allocated into this one thing. You might have stocks or something else, but none of those are going to compare to what you're working on as, as an entrepreneur. Um, and so... COVID will test, if you started a company during COVID, you're definitely testing those boundaries and you're going to be a greater entrepreneur uh, from coming out from, the, from all of this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello, James. Welcome. Hello. Oh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. So uh, we're just doing a little introduction, so maybe you could uh, join in and introduce yourself. Yeah, James Hanusa, uh, Stardust Studios, calling in from Phoenix. Um, a little bit on my entrepreneurial journey. I've been uh, in and around the climate change movement for about 15 years. Um, got into cities and uh, urban innovation, uh, a fellow with Global Urban Development and uh, Urban Innovation Exchange. So working with uh, the intersection of uh, public-private partnerships with corporate and, uh, and municipal governments. And then uh, got into emerging technologies uh, and impact. So Digital Rain was uh, my last venture before Startup Studios. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and my name is Anikin, Anikin Day. I'm born and bred Norwegian, uh, currently living in uh, Los Angeles, California. And uh, I, uh, I, I'm a founder of Corporate Spring, which is a um, consultancy uh, working on corporate culture and leadership. And we work with a lot of startup companies and helping them build high performing cultures uh, as they grow, start early on building those kind of cultures that will make them succeed later on. Um, and we also work with Fortune 500 companies. So it's a bit uh, all over the place. Um, and I used to work in the corporate world myself and started this company because uh, I never found the kind of consultancy I wanted to hire. So I went to create that kind of company myself. So entrepreneurship is, is, is in my, my kind of my, my blood and my, my, my mindset. Uh, but I've been coming from very much the corporate background and now I'm very happy to be out of it and, and live the entrepreneurial life. Good. So then uh, we introduced ourselves and let's just uh, start talking about um, the first question. And, and uh, John, you touched on, up on it a little bit already, but. We know there's been a lot of challenges that this last year, um, but what good has come out of it? Was, do anyone want to start with like something positive that you actually seen happening to your business or your 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 role maybe as an entrepreneur as well um, because uh, of COVID? I'll go first. Uh, like 
our company, Extensia, has been all remote from the beginning. I mean, I was being being a musician in the past. I tried to be as flexible as possible with any gig that I took on, and that led into basically saying, "Well, you know what? A lot of the times I can do my work uh, remotely," and that was a lot of friction. So, like, I spent basically the last twenty years just dealing with that friction. Like, you need to be in this place. Like, we need to have these meetings. You need to. Like, I don't trust that you guys are going to work uh, when you're not around. And and so, like, when we started Extensio, we decided that for various reasons, we could have said the all remote culture. And that, that helped in us in many ways, which I can list shortly. But then, you know, like, we were still, whenever we talked to somebody, it was like there was a lot of uh, suspicion if that model was working. There were, like, a couple of companies who are doing a really good job with that, but they were just exceptions. Mm-hmm. And with a flip of a switch, all of a sudden with COVID, we realized that you know, like the work needs to be done sometimes remotely. And the first couple of months was, again, uh, not the easiest for companies for that transition because it wasn't part of their DNA. But even those companies actually were able to make this happen. And necessity is the motherhood of all you mentioned. So like, we invented all these new ways of working you know, mm-hmm. that led to a lot of new platforms to, to surface themselves. But I think the, one of the most important things was like actually the company started believing and trusting their employees more. Mm-hmm. Management started giving more space to uh, the workers, saying that, you know what, we only care about the impact. So the whole world started being more evolving around impact than the, than the, than the time, time cards. Mm-hmm. For us, it has been already helpful the last four or five years in terms of cost, in terms of being able to access the talent across the globe, not being limited to the city that you're in, creating also a competitive uh, landscape for all employees. Now, like you're basically a part of a workforce that's not only a part of your local environment, but it's it's all global. So, like that leads to a better understanding about the standard for the work that you're doing as well. Uh, cost has been a really major one, obviously. I mean, everything still you know, is very much bound to your local expenses for sure. But then at the same time, there are, there are a lot of situations where you're able to hire from different places and work still gets done. And a lot of times you don't need that person to be in the same team, same location as you are. Uh, but again, like I think that one of the most important things which shifts all mindset for business has been that well, now we, we trust our employees more. We, we, we are able to structure our expectations not around the timelines, but around the impact that we're expecting from those people. Yeah, great. What about you, Michael? What have you experienced? I cannot think of anything that's been good from coronavirus. I think it's all entirely bad. I think um, we, will, we will reach for myths about how this has been good for us in any way. Uh, they are all myths. Um, I think that it has been a, an unmitigated bad thing for the world. Now, our job as the panel is to look for the green shoots. So I can see green shoots from this. <clears throat> I can see things that the world will do to react from this. Uh, the world is in some way a river and the stone got thrown in the river and the water will flow around the stone. So how will the world change? First of all, Herostas is, of course, in a lot of ways about emerging markets. I, I think that my biggest fear has to do with emerging markets and the slowdown in health and development in emerging markets. I think this will be pretty bad for America. We'll get past it, we'll come out of it stronger. Uh, China will probably navigate its own way. Uh, <clears throat> I think that Europe is at risk of uh, increased tension. This may be the straw that breaks the European camel's back because of the, the incompetence of the European Union in negotiating its vaccine contracts. They over-bureaucratized their vaccine contracts and got tangled in the legal weeds. So maybe freedom will come back to Europeans who want to govern themselves. But I think apart from that, in the emerging markets of the world, I think this could be very devastating and set the world back by 10 years. And I think what's happening that is going to amplify that problem is the very high likelihood of significant inflation around the world. The The United States has the great advantage still of being a reserve currency. So we can keep printing more and more money. Uh, but uh, the effect of this on hot money, on hot money flows, on inflation around the world is going to be very devastating. The, 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 the opportunity in the future 
is therefore for innovation probably in fintech. I think fintech is going to be surprisingly, it was sort of a buzzword a year and a half ago. And now suddenly again, fintech should be one of the great investable areas where new forms of money, new forms of transfer, new forms of reserve, new forms of uh, storage of value will be very, very, very useful. I think banking will suffer, uh, transfer payments mechanisms will suffer. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation in fintech. Um, and then I think you will see uh, you will see a lot of investment in life sciences. I think that is obvious and necessary. Uh, we have seen a, a, an incredible acceleration of growth in the in the uh, the speed, uh, the stunning speed of this vaccination program that was led chiefly by uh, very nimble uh, um, American and British companies. Um, and I think you will see now a, an increasing interest in the innovations of mRNA and other forms of uh, life science innovation that will then give give rise to a lot of uh, disease curing, disease prevention, and so forth. And then I'm hoping, I don't know this will be true, I'm hoping that for the emerging markets in particular, there will be innovation in agritech, so that, that the, the agriculture, that the food chain, the supply chain of food globally can be uh, complexified, can be uh, in some ways simplified, and that uh, people can eat and source and eat food of more diverse and interesting kinds globally. But basically, basically, unfortunately, I think the obvious thing is probably true. Coronavirus is very, very, very bad for the world. It has been very bad for the world. We will react, we will adapt, we will overcome. The human race is very good at that. I hope is around the corner. But I regret to say that I think for emerging markets, we have not yet begun to see the full extent of the pain that will come from this and come from the enormous uh, money printing that was probably necessary, but certainly will have decades of impact uh, on, on many people around the world, uh, especially in the emerging markets, I fear. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for also looking for something positive that uh, can come out of that, like the human race being, you know, resilient and adaptable. Which I think very is resilient, very adaptable. We will, we will overcome, but I don't think it was a good thing that we had to go through this. No, I don't, I don't think any of us right. <laughs> actually think right. that. Right, right, right. But uh, yeah, no, but thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, Daniel, um, do you have any, uh, any reactions to what you heard so far or anything you want to... Share with sure. us. Um, sure. So um, some really great, insightful comments mm -hmm. from fellow speakers and panelists. Um, from you know, I'm just going to probably share from our business point of view. We've basically 10 x um, during COVID, so um, it's been phenomenal for you know for Google Chat the business, and most of the people in terms of entrepreneurs that I know within the circle have definitely suffered. The ma its majority. And I think that applies to globally. Uh, but very fortunately, we were able to pivot uh, in time and also capitalize the, the opportunities. And I'll share some, I'll share some, some of the, some of the opportunities that arise. Um, for example, lots of people, you know, stay from home. You know, lots of people work from home, lots of people stayed in. So being in the mobile apps market, that was one of the booming sectors for us. And naturally, we, we gained. 500% uh, more new clients, so so that that was a win. But at the same time, we, we had to be able to scale quickly, fast, and be able to be ready for the new demands. So we, it, you know, it's a side of an investment. So what I wanted to share um, is that before COVID, before you know this whole COVID pandemic globally, um, lots of my entrepreneurial friends they were. Now, some of them, they will laugh at me and say, why do you want to keep so much cash reserve within your business? You know, most of them would basically take out some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the capital and invest in the stock market or property market. But for me, I, I wanted to keep uh, a much longer runway just in case, you know, I'm just a bit of a reserve person. So then COVID came and every single one of them basically failed their businesses. You know, some of them only had three months runway. Actually, one of them had one month and she was telling me she wanted to fundraise. I mean, there's no way you could fundraise during COVID within a month, to be honest, <laughs> let alone the TV. So it's, it's, you know, for me, you know, we have over two years runway. So I think, um, I think, you know, during, I think COVID, um, one of the biggest factor I've learned is to ensure that you have enough runway for your business. You know, if, if I have to say, you know, 
because you've got to keep your team going, especially if you have a growing business. You know, if you if you basically lose out on your cash flow, then you'll have to basically, you know, speak to the banks and ask for facilities. If not, you have to cut rates. But all of those takes time, and and time. If you're not utilizing time properly, it could play against you, which is a risk in itself. So, um, so that's one of the lessons I, I, I would like to share. Um, and talking about opportunities, you know, think uh, companies like Zoom. They they obviously were booming. One of my friends who started a similar platform called Remo. They they also boomed. Uh, I think uh, they actually did a lot better than us. They I think they almost did sixty uh, eight in terms of revenue growth. In, in 10 months, so that's massive. Um, and, uh, they were a US company as well, so if um, if fellow uh, Michael uh, are potentially looking for investment, they are a good one, I think. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of a global scale, I, I would, you know, what, what, one of the, actually, one of the tra- transformation we, we, we did was that we stopped traveling. As a startup in the uh, mobile business, we had to attend and exhibit global events. So we would travel to 20 different cities globally, you know, all the way from you know from Hong Kong to Israel, China, Japan, Tokyo, um, Korea, you know, US, UK, all of those major cities will have to go and exhibit. And COVID came, we couldn't travel. So we couldn't exhibit and we couldn't establish new partnership. So we actually lost a major revenue stream in a way, and, and potential collaboration stream. And, and we had to pivot quickly, um, and, and, and that's what we did. You know, we, we basically reinvested into other channels to maintain and scale um, the, 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 the business opportunities. Um, so yeah, that, that's my story. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, what about you, Michael? Um, oh, sorry, James, do you have any Think positive that you can see have come out of this not so positive situation. Yeah, I uh, I think that the time for reflection um, and this reset has really driven uh, some of the maybe values evolution or at least uh, consideration. I think of it, you know, this whole time not just uh, COVID as disease, but um, all the other uh, cultural. Uh, things that have happened in this time from Black Lives Matter to uh, political changes in the U.S. Um, and, you know, giving people the time to really uh, consider where they want to go. And uh, I think the some of the outcomes of that reflection um, that, that we've been putting time into is really the importance of narrative. Um, so I think technology is very, very important. Uh, obviously, I think that McKinsey said we went through about 10 years of uh, digital transformation in two years. Um, and I think that's true from the corporate investment as well as um, from the B2C side. Uh, so the e-commerce mm-hmm. gains. So I think those that area of massive investment in technology and the behavior change that has come with that um, is an opportunity going forward um, in a wider range of technologies. Um, but that's, that's what we've looked at a lot is, is just, um, how much the changes happened. And I think that, you know, being more of a city's guy in my past entrepreneurial journey, um, I think home is, is where a lot of opportunity is going to be going forward. I don't, I think there will be a return to the office, but, um, I would be betting more on home being kind of the center of, of all life activity going forward. Great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. What about you, John? Um, so, I, yeah, I think the framing of COVID, COVID, the positive framing of COVID should be one of a global shared experience. Um, so just like the maybe a world war, um, it's something that we're going to be able to talk about with everybody on the planet Um, for the rest of our lives and and for the future to come. So it's at least some type of shared global bonding experience. And that that should be the positive that that has come out of it. And I I definitely agree that um, we would be net better if it did not happen. Um, But uh, if we can frame it as this is an opportunity for shared experience and shared empathy, 
um, then I think that's going to be the that's going to be the best way to frame it going for, going forward. Uh, the two more levels of that on the business side, we're lucky because we work in e-commerce, and so I, I think similar to Daniel, our business 10 x um, uh, and I was able to do one to begin doing one on ones with um, all of our coworkers, which I wasn't doing before because I would see them every once in a while in the hall, and that was that was enough. Um, but doing one on ones, I've learned that uh, my coworkers make music videos. Um, that one is really into uh, mountain biking. Uh, one is a competitive swimmer. It, it's things that I would never have learned um, if I if I wasn't to to the the level of the support team having one on one calls with with everyone and um I, you know i've been an entrepreneur for my whole life but i hadn't realized the benefit of doing that with just the entire team hmm. um so then now on a on a personal level uh while i lost my uncle at the beginning beginning of covid i'm very happy that to be working remote um so that i can follow my fiance uh, so this this time I, I was very locked up and being in being in one place, but being able to be remote, I'm able to follow her career um, and be a, a traveling spouse. So I hope that that continues to go forward because too often it's I think the traditional would be that the woman is following the man, and I'm I'm very happy to be able to follow my fiance's career. She's a journalist, um, and so uh, yeah, ha- happy to be able to move where she moves. For you, very cool, <laughs> very cool. Okay, so uh, for me, I, so I uh, personally, um, I, I agree with actually everything um, you'll be saying, and, and personally, I must say this um, openness to remote work and uh, openness for people accepting that you can actually have a video call, you don't have to travel around the world in order to meet for two hours meeting uh, that has made my life at least uh, a lot easier. Um, so I travel quite a lot and I do public speaking and sometimes I have to get on a plane to go to Beijing. And I always ask, can I do it on video? Uh, get it for half the price. <laughs> but no, uh, they want me to be in that room. And it's it's many reasons why that is that a good idea, but that still has been part of my life in many ways. So I had a lot of more time on my hands. Uh, I've been doing a lot of virtual keynotes and actually seeing now that um, clients are happy with that and, and say they want to continue doing that to a larger extent. So that's a good thing. Um, I also come from the video conferencing industry. I used to work uh, in Tanberg, which was one of the early uh, video conferencing companies uh, established in Norway. And, uh, and I started there in 2002. So I've been working on video since 2002. And every year we said that, okay, this is the year when the world is going to understand what great technology this is, right? We said that every year, uh, then uh, until we were bought by Cisco in 2010. Uh, and uh, and I always thought that the world has to wake up to this way of communicating. Uh, and now they have. Uh, and it took a pandemic in order for that to happen. So so I see that actually as a positive thing for for life quality, but also for the environment, uh, for productivity for, for companies as well. So, and, and I, I don't think we're going to go back to the old. I don't think people are going to travel as much. It's, I think people long for traveling and want to travel more maybe because they want that human connection, but I don't think businesses will uh, allow that to, to such a great extent. The other one is for my business. So we're consultancy and we uh, do a lot of in-person, but also virtual work with our clients. Um, but we have uh, also seen it. We saw a pretty big dip in client engagement pretty early on. And uh, what we then chose to do uh, is like, okay, so so how do we kind of meet this situation? How do we spend this time wisely? How do we reinvent ourselves? So what we have ended up doing is actually start creating a learning platform um, where we can scale what we already do, you know, more on a one-to-one basis. So for us, this, we wouldn't have done that without the, the pandemic. We wouldn't have time for it. And we wouldn't kind of be forced to look at ourselves and see, like, how are we as a consultancy going to be relevant in this new world of work? Um, so that is another thing that I saw is, is a lot of things that wouldn't have happened without that. So 
not saying it is a good thing, but are saying that these are the positive uh, consequences of experience. Yeah, but guys, let Anakin, if I may, I, I think I think we should <clears throat> acknowledge that we represent a very narrow sliver of the global economy, <laughs> and that our experiences of having apps and investments that grow. Uh, and that having the ability to go on Zoom instead of a flight across the ocean represents a tiny, tiny fraction of the global economy. And we all know this. I think everyone on the panel is doing a, a good job of trying to say something nice. But, you know, between 150 and 250 million job equivalents were lost last year globally. And for most of the countries of the earth, they are not going to come back for years or decades. And the, the effect on social unrest, on political unrest, on political instability uh, will be felt for decades. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's charming that we had growth in our apps and we had growth in our ability to do remote work and sync up with people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it's sort of charming and it's also globally not terribly important. Um, these are our felt experiences. This, this, is, this is the time for people like us to be thinking far more not about what's convenient for our life-work balance, although we've all had benefits. And for those of us who are sitting at this part of the pyramid, I bet you your stock portfolios have gone up. I bet you your Bitcoin investments have gone up. I bet you your crypto investments have gone up. Uh, but but it, we, we have to remember there are probably about a quarter billion people effectively out of work from last year compared to the year before. And that's larger than the working population of the United States. And the $2 trillion that the United States just put into the global economy last week uh, will be generally good for everybody for a while, but will also create massive inflationary pressure in the entire continent of Africa, probably, that will result in political instability and result in the collapse of democratic governments. This is very, 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 very bad consequential stuff. And so I, I think uh, in, 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 a, in a setting like this, uh, we should just as equally say, what can we do that will be positive? Uh, what can we do that will be constructive? Um, where can we invest our capital resources and so forth? How can we facilitate, for example, picking up on the theme of cryptocurrency? I'm not a particularly crypto person, but like cryptocurrency as a, as a concept. How can we make it much easier for people to store value personally, perhaps in some digital currency, perhaps even a digital dollar, or perhaps a digital renminbi, dare I say, or maybe a digital cryptocurrency, so that if their currency collapses, if their currency locally in their country goes to 10,000% inflation, they will, not be, they will not lose their livelihoods and their farms and their wealth. So... Look, I think we're all trying to put on a smiling face. That's the job of the panel. I know that. I know that. We're all doing that. Um, but it's 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 very easy to walk around Silicon Valley and see people get a lot wealthier this past year. It's been it's been stunning what happened. In Q2 of last year, we did not know that was going to happen. But then by Q4, we thought, wow, this has turned out to be a wealth creating moment. And America will be fine. And our businesses will be fine, thank God. But um, I think we're going to see the effect of this be increasingly bad, increasingly bad, not just from a health perspective. And so uh, all of us are well-meaning people, good-meaning people. What can we do to provide tools to people who, who don't think about going on Zoom when they have to go to, to work, uh, who don't think about those kinds of things? Um, uh, you know, I, 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 this is, after all, an emerging markets uh, uh, setting. And so Let's think about that. Uh, let's think about that. I'm sure your hedge fund positions will be better off than they were last year. Um, and God willing, that's good for everybody. But how can we put that money to work? And by the way, I'm not calling for higher tax. <laughs> I'm not calling for higher tax. I'm asking what can we do about it? Because we're also also talented and, and capable, as are the audience. Um, yeah. I'm sure you're thinking about this. I'm sure we're all thinking about this. I don't think I'm the only person thinking about this. But let us remember, let's light a candle for this most important topic, which is definitely not the people who even can attend uh, this session. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should then move into uh, like, what can we do, but then talk about the skills. What, what is the kind Great. of skill set that we need in order to, to do that? And, and uh, time is running and we've got 10 minutes left. So, so let's, uh, let's go the round now. It's like, what kind of skills will help us uh, create a better world or, or create better companies or contribute in positive ways? Um, 
John, you want to? I'll, I'll just say that I think Daniel had, um, a, it was great that Daniel mentioned building a profitable company or building a company that had resilience built, built in, in, in terms of excess resources. Um, that's the way that entrepreneurs typically around the world have to build companies because they don't have access um, to, uh, to Michael to fund them. So the, the, the majority of people like my dad who has a mechanic shop, they're just building regular, regular businesses um, and are not able to run for a month from collapse you know, as, as all of my friends run their companies. And Daniel, as, as you were saying, um, I rec- I recognize that because I bootstrapped my last company. Um, and so, yeah, have, I've always tried to hold more, more cash. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is a recommendation, but I, I recognize that more of, yeah, more of us will have to run our businesses in that way. And, um, yeah, there, there's certainly something to be, to be said about that for the, the way the rest of the world is running their business. Um, yeah, that's, that's my, my take on that. Mm. Thank you. Michael. Well, look, I think the, uh, the reskilling of the world is very, very, um, very much upon us. Um, I think one of the better uh, themes that I've seen, if we want to leapfrog uh, the, 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 the past and into the future, one of the better themes I've seen is the, um, the challenge to the traditional uh, tertiary uh, education system. Uh, university, liberal arts universities, to be sure, are uh, a gift of the last several centuries to our future and our present day. Um, but we now know that you can certify uh, in a short amount of time, uh, you can certify people with certain skills, um, individuals with certain skills that are appropriate to their background and, and, and training level, and then get them working at a exponentially, geometrically higher compensation rate very soon. And that is happening naturally in the world. It's been happening for decades. But the acceleration of the skill-based learning and the skill-based learning, which then results in a job, and the innovation where you can uh, effectively uh, pay X dollars to train someone, help them get a job, and then get some revenue share till your investment is paid off uh, is upon us. It's, you're seeing it around the world. And I think that is, that, is, uh, that is terrific. I'm chiefly concerned uh, in the long term about the power law curve that we're seeing in, in our in, in our current economy, the, the the wealthy keep getting wealthy, wealthy, wealthier, um, and uh, that's probably good for the people on this panel in some sense, but it's not good for us in other sense, and not good for everybody. So I think I think that investing in skill based, certification based training, uh, in many dimensions, in many dimensions, will be very very good for creating wealth, helping helping firm up and create true middle classes in many of the parts of the world where the Gini coefficient is not optimal, where the middle class has been has never existed or has been hollowed out after over the years. And the, the best chance to preserve the democratic political process in those countries is often to have a very strong invested middle class who want the polity to succeed. And so uh, by, by training that up, you then create enough wealth that then the overall economy can grow and all sectors of the economy can grow. The alternative the alternative, which is terrifying to me, is a command economy, as you see in China. Um, the, the Chinese Communist Party has been very, very good at lifting a lot of people out of poverty. And I think they're getting a second look uh, as to whether their path was the best. And I hope that everyone concludes it's not. Um, but uh, it is certainly very alluring in certain ways from that perspective. Uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that those of us who represent the capitalist economy, like, like John and his dad and his mom, um, uh, we'll we'll take take it upon ourselves to skill the world so they can create those middle classes that are strong, resilient. Then the political stability continues, and people are better off. So I think skill based, certification based training programs they're fundable, they're available, they're extensible, and they're scalable, and they work. Thank you, James. Yeah, um, I think uh, what we've been seeing is. Uh, more, more and more in the um, in the corporate world, in advertising and education, um, more of a focus on social impact and go to market. 
So I think that is going to be important going forward uh, as that becomes more of a customer facing and um, and the narrative and the message uh, um, that's connecting is 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 um, is making more market traction. I think uh, an understanding of culture and youth, um, especially in, in some of the emerging markets. And I think, you know, a combination of e-commerce, logistics, um, subscription models from the financial realm, and potentially even government funding, uh, and how to get to that government funding um, being important skill sets uh, for entrepreneurs going forward. Thank you. So I see we have five minutes left. Uh, so let's uh, be very quick. The last one, Alper, um, what's your... Uh... Uh, sure. I think like the world is actually going through back and forth between globalization and localization between these the changes. We've seen a lot of polls being created, but I'm also seeing a lot of transparency that is fighting that polarization. So I think something is going to come out of that friction altogether. So we're now being able to uh, communicate more openly, and I think that that should lead to something greater in the in the if maybe not in the immediate future, but in the midterm and then after. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so we don't have much time, but um, I, I I think we could talk for a lot longer if time were allowed. And you know, as an entrepreneur, I I thought today was about you know entrepreneurs. So before mm -hmm. we talk about how to help you know, the mass majority. I actually think that we should talk about how to help ourselves and fellow entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because during COVID, many entrepreneurs have been taken hit badly. And, you know, my advice and my tactics and visions, I'd be more than happy to share my beliefs as well. We should definitely, being an entrepreneur is lonely. It's very lonely. You know, nobody's gonna cover your ass when you fail, right? You know, it's all from your own pocket. Yes, you may have had investment but what about those 99 percent who couldn't raise money couldn't raise funding i was one of them seven years ago so i know how how, how you know it's i i think being an entrepreneur for those who are listening for those who are probably going to watch this recording video um should definitely pay more attention about how to survive first you know yes you're creating a business but you have to be able to be profitable first get your first client get your first funding you know yes you can be passionate you can talk about all these dreams and stuff that you can save the world, but to be honest with you, you've got to save yourself first. Who's going to pay for the bills? Who's going to pay for the rent? Who's going to pay for the salary? That's an so, entrepreneur. That's an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah I'm just an entrepreneur. So I, I think deep down, that's an entrepreneur. We, should, we should definitely help each other first before we can actually move forward. We should align ourselves. First. But one last wrap up is about not giving up. To me, it's very simple. It's about not giving up. There's lots of hurdles we've got to go through. There'll be more problems coming up, more challenges, probably another type of pandemic soon. But we've got to act so others can react. Mm. Yes, very good input there. And, and you're right. And I think um, the ability to live in uncertainty, I mean, that's always been the part of the entrepreneurial journey. Unless you can handle living in uncertainty, you probably shouldn't be an entrepreneur, right? Uh, but like, as you said, uh, it's important to that put the life mask on yourself because before you actually can help others. So kind of investing in that, investing in yourself and, 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 uh, not only thinking about your company, but you're going to, you, you have to live and survive as an entrepreneur as well. Um, and especially if you have people that, uh, that you, that working for you as well, how do you take care of, of them as well? So uh, since I am um, the moderator, it's one minute left. I'll take the opportunity and, and liberty of, of kind of having the end comment. And, and, and I want to end on a positive note uh, because uh, working with lots of um, entrepreneurial companies, working with, with a lot of companies, a positive thing I've seen, uh, it has to do with that new connection and that new openness. Uh, people uh, are sharing more of what they are experiencing, how they are experiencing it. And there's a new um, awareness in the corporate world uh, uh, around like the human aspect of their business, having to invest in their people, being more human uh, in our interactions. So, so if I could say that one thing that I am seeing actually is a positive thing that is coming out is, is like we all uh, are unified in our humanness. And that goes for us as entrepreneurs, but also like in the corporate world and 
to care for the rest of the world as well. So, um, so thank you everyone for, for participating. I think we could have continued talking for another hour or so, but uh, at least it, it started some thoughts and I hope uh, those of you who are listening have enjoyed it as well. And feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. So thank you for moderating, Annika. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye folks.